Welcome to this week's Moment with Mickey. Today, I have a special guest, Debbie Heiser. Uh, Debbie helps business people earn a lot of money and doing so, doing what they love without sacrificing what's most important to them. And I want to welcome Debbie and please share with our audience all about Debbie. Mickey, thank you for having me, first of all. And yeah, so before we started to record, you had said, talk about where I grew up. So I'm just going to start at the beginning. I actually grew up most of my life in the Midwest. And there's some really great things about that. And then there's some messaging that comes from being in that Midwest kind of region, um, as is other regions as well, have different messaging that comes. But I grew up um, in Iowa and I was there until fifth grade. And I had the unique opportunity to move three times then between middle school and high school. And the reason I say that that way is that, yeah, there are some negative things that potentially came out of that. But for the most part, I give a lot of credence to me being as extroverted and as social as I am. I don't know a stranger. And part of that was learning that I needed to make connection with people. So we lived in Denver, Colorado for a year in a suburb. And then we moved to Chicago and lived in Elgin, Illinois for two years, my seventh and eighth grade year. And then we moved to Platte City, Missouri in my freshman year in high school. And my extended family is all from Southeast Kansas. So my parents were thrilled about that. And I went to high school there. Then we ended up raising our son there and he went through kindergarten to graduation um, at the same school I went to high school. And And I went to school at a college. It's not named this anymore. They renamed them and I don't know what the name is, but it's Central Missouri State University, home of the mules. And my best friend, Barb Bruce, and I went to college together and that's where we met and stayed in touch throughout the the years. And when she moved to Sandpoint, um, we kind of lost touch. And she called me one day and said, hey, would you drive cross country with me? I'm leaving Connecticut. My Her mom had um, lung cancer and had a lung removed. Hmm. And I said, sure. So we drove cross country. And that was my first, well, I woke up in the morning to this view of Lake Ponderé and the mountains out in Odin Bay. And I fell in love. And so after many, many years, 30 years or more, Um, well, more than that, of living in Platte City. I was married at the time and I have one son and we decided to move up here. I worked, um, I have an education degree and I started out my career with Sprint Publishing and Advertising. I'm going to age myself here, but I was in the yellow page business and I sold yellow pages, which I find interesting. It's come full circle because my boss um, in the training department helped me realize we were selling hopes, wishes, and dreams and helping people gain more clients or gain more customers into their place of business created more income than then allowed them to go do the things that they want to do, which I feel like today I do very similar in that aspect, um, just in a different way. And so I had the unique opportunity to work there. And that's where I really got introduced to servant leadership. And I didn't know what it was called at the time. And after about 10 years there, I left, they sold that part of the business And my mom was sick with breast cancer at the time. And so we decided to stay in Kansas City, which is um, home of the blues and barbecue, which I kind of miss sometimes here in Sandpoint. But um, I digress. But I worked for Sprint and then I moved into a role at Citibank. And so I went from being a big fish because I was an executive in a small pond at Sprint Publishing into this Ocean. I was only five down from the CEO of Citibank, but there were 13 of me across the country and the breadth of Citibank with 300,000 employees. I was all of a sudden a guppy in the ocean. And so that was an interesting transition. At that time, I was there about 10 years and I used to come up to Sandpoint to visit Barb and I met a woman here, Colleen Hayes, who had opened a business, sold it to her employees and they moved to Spokane. She was starting another business and was talking to me about it because I actually had an interview with a company you used to work for. And I had a third interview and they called me before the interview and said, don't bother coming. Financial um, statements came back. Things are not good. 
And I was here because I had decided to go back and get my master's because I knew to get a position that I was in in corporate at the level that I was in, I would need at least a master's. So I went and got my master's at Gonzaga and I was here for an immersion class that I had. And Colleen talked to me about coming up and working for her as she was starting this new business. So I made the decision and jumped and we moved to Sandpoint back in 2014. And I helped, um, unfortunately, Colleen passed away about four months later and her daughter and sister owned the company as well. So I stayed on there actually until I think it was 2020, maybe 21. I, I lose track of time. But um, I worked there, was a CFO. I did everything but sales and recruiting and had a great run. Um, but with COVID and, you know, declining medical. So it was a medical billing company. Um, yeah. We placed temporary people in hospitals. And so um, there came a time when Jennifer and I, or Jen and I looked at each other and I'm like, you can't afford me anymore. And she's like, you want to go do your coaching business? So Perfect. So I then stepped into my business and I haven't looked back. It, it was the best thing I've ever done, Mickey. And, you know, are there times of stress? Absolutely. But I love what I do. And part of what I love about it is, you know, you and I were talking a little bit about transitions. One of the toughest transitions for me, I'm going to talk about two. One was moving to the North, you know, cause we're 60 miles South of Canada was it about three o'clock in the middle of winter? I'm like, oh, it's time to go home because it's dark. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, in Kansas City, you know, like because we're that far north, it gets dark so fast here. Yes. But I would say one of the biggest transition, well, there's a lot of challenges, I think, when you transition from corporate into owning your own business. And because I worked for a smaller business and that whole year after Colleen had passed away, it was almost like divine intervention where it taught me how to run a business. And but the transition for me really was about my time story. You know, I was so used to working eight to five Monday through Friday oh. that I'm like, oh, I have to work Monday through Friday, eight to five. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm the creator of my own life. Do I, do I really need to do that? And it took me three or four years, like, because Jen's business was more like it was my business too. And so we had some flexibility, but it took me a while to figure out I could go ski Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings and come in at work at 1230 or one o'clock. And, you know, it's funny. I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, what day is it? Because there's not a day that I'm not thinking about my business or that I'm not doing something in it but I don't spend all day at it necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, where it's hard, I think for people. And I have conversations with people all the time, my sisters included where like yesterday I went to my son's house and my grandson and I, and my son walked over to the park and we played in the park. I came back and I had a couple hours of meetings. Then we went down to the lake lot and swam in the, at the beach for a couple of hours, I came back and grabbed my stuff, went to a friend's, went to learn how to line dance. You know, like it, it was a full day, but I still did some work and I'll probably do some work this weekend too, but it's, it's not like full on eight hours at a time. Hmm. And I choose to dabble a little bit too on the weekends. Now there's sometimes when I'm like, eh, this day is for me, I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But that I think was one of the biggest transitions for me going into an entrepreneurial role is understanding that I could create my own schedule. And so sometimes when I get re a really full schedule, I'm like, oh, you did that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like step back and figure it out, you know, and there's different seasons that I go through where I'm trying to figure out, okay, this is, I'm better in the morning to study. It's this universal law of rhythm. I'm better mind-wise in the morning. So I don't love to work out in the morning. So maybe I don't work out in the morning. Maybe I go work out here or maybe I do and then still have my study time. So it's a constant learning, but that was a big transition for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what made you decide that you, you know, I understand that the smaller business was, you know, winding down, but what yeah. did you decide that you wanted? What was the spark that you had to create your own business? Yeah, it's interesting because I legally started my business in 2014 and I was doing it as a side gig. 
But prior to that, a good friend of mine, Lori Mallory and I, we worked together in Yellow Pages. She called me and said, hey, would you help me do this business assessment? And my focus has traditionally been more in the HR realm. I mean, I'm, I know ops as well, but has been more in the HR realm. And so that was my focus. And I did employee interviews and that type of thing. Interestingly enough, I didn't realize the connection until later that it was a medical billing cycle company that we did this audit on. So that kind of started the thought process around, hmm, what would this look like, right? So then in 2014, when I moved to Sandpoint, I had done an audit for a business in town, a good friend of mine, Angela, and had gone through some stuff with her before I moved here. And then when I moved here, um, I had someone approach me and say, hey, I'd like to sell my business. Would you work with me and help me get it sellable? I'm like, sure. So we sat down and, you know, I charged her minimal amount. And it was interesting because I got to thinking, hmm, I could probably like make some money doing this. Like I could make this a living. So I proceeded. I had some additional clients. One was a small retail store here in town that I would say actually is more of a medium size. It's kind of like a Whole Foods. And I had different clients that I was working with. And throughout the time, it's morphed. But the reason I got into it was because I have this desire to help people live out their hopes, wishes, and dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Life is too short to feel like you're punching a clock, that you're living for the weekends. And I think we there's a different way to do it. We've just been taught generationally, you know, over and over again, just different messages. And doesn't mean that I don't work hard. I work hard. You know, I had somebody on the ski lift this last year say to me, well, when do you work? And I'm like, well, you know, keep your own messages to yourself. But, you know, it's like, it's just a different way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels countercultural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I you, answered your question, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you've, you've come to a, a place where you're comfortable with that. And are there yeah. parts of your business though, that um, you don't like to do? And so you procrastinate on? Um, actually, Mickey, you know what? I would say there's very few. I, mm -hmm. I did do that before, but typically what ends up happening for me is I have learned to step out in faith. And what I mean by that is very early on, and keep in mind, I had a business coach that helped point this out. Cause even though I'm a coach, I'm too close to my stuff. And so it's important to have a coach. Mm -hmm. And we were talking because, oh gosh, I don't even know how many years ago this was. I knew I could create my own landing pages for events. I knew I could do those things. I just didn't want to, right? And I kept resisting that. And so immediately I called my friend, Jenny. I said, hey, you're really good at this. Would you be willing to do some one-off projects? Absolutely. Bam, got things going. So for me, I take a look at, and I, it's also, I, I, coach a lot of things that seem counterintuitive, right? Like I'm the first one to say, I was basically a CFO for the small business. I know how to do my books and QuickBooks, but here's how I look at it. I can pay someone $500 a month to balance all my accounts, do all of those things. Tell me what I need to do for taxes, all of that stuff. And they're much better at it. And in that couple of hours that it took me to do it, that I probably was doing it wrong. I can make a whole lot more money. Right. And it's not all about money, but that's a, that's an, a decision point for me. So then I look at too marketing. This just happened, Mickey. Back in December, a good friend of mine, she was a co-host of mine, actually, when I very first started my podcast, um, has been in marketing for years. She and I met, she was trying to kind of figure out which direction to go next with her company. And so I coached her and then she coached me on some marketing pieces. And at that time, I thought to myself, I need to hire her right now. <laughs> And I preach to people and coach to people, the minute you think you need to hire, hire. Even if you don't feel like you have the money, hire. <laughs> and here's why. Because when I hired Jenny to do those landing pages, I made revenue. Wow. So the longer I procrastinated that, the longer I closed myself off to, to bringing in revenue. Same thing happened when I hired my bookkeeper and my CPA. Right. It opened up time for me to go be on podcasts, for me to go talk to clients, do the things that I'm really good at. Mm -hmm. Then when it came to marketing, I finally reached out to um, reached out to Meredith about a month ago and said, OK, I own it. Right. Like I, I don't live in the woulda, coulda, shoulda, but mm, probably should have hired you back in December. <laughs> and what would it take to have you like be like my CMO? 
-hmm. And I'm making a pretty huge investment in this, knowing though that the the things that she like we're in this process of rebranding. We're in this process of like redoing all of my profiles, looking at doing everything that will set me up for my three-year vision. I've been reading this book called Vivid Vision. I highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. And it talks about three years from now, what what do I want this business to look like, right? And that's part of what I do with people is I help them look at what do they want their life to look like? So the business is a part of making that happen. And so she's out doing all of these things. And in the process, yes, I've built relationships with those things. But literally in the last month, I've signed two private clients. I have a third one that's out, actually a four, two other ones out um, that are kind of on the fence. You know, the, the fear comes into play. Mm -hmm. And I've signed up two people for my October retreat and I'm starting a mastermind that after this airs, it will have already started that I've got four people that have enrolled for this mastermind, right? Mm -hmm. So those things wouldn't have happened. They would have, it just would have been a lot slower. Right. Right. But it's an investment. Would you say that if there's something that you really don't enjoy doing and there's something that you're not really good at? If, mm-hmm. if that thing lands on both of those, that's a good thing to outsource. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And then I would also have a coach like you or me help them through what's the resistance about. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes the resistance isn't just that they don't want to do it. Sometimes the resistance might be they don't want to be visible. Okay, well, why don't I go back to the why, the five whys, yes. you know, that when I work from, like, why don't you want to be visible? Oh, well, then because I become bigger than my sisters, I'm making this up. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, then what happens for you? Well, I was always the youngest and I was behind the scene, right? And we unpack these double binds and these loyalty packs that we have with people mm-hmm. because there are things that will hold us back that we're even good at and we don't realize we're good at. Right. Because yeah. they've been ingrained in our self subconscious. Yes. And the subconscious is what is driving the bus. Uh, we think we are. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. There's a really good book and I can't, I should know this before I source it. I think it's called Blink that talks about an elephant. There's a path and the elephant and the elephant trainer. And the elephant trainer is our discipline, our, our head, right? Saying, oh, we need to do this and this and this. And the elephant is, it's not the heart, not the feeling necessarily, but it's that um, subconscious piece of us, right? And the path is our discipline or our, you know, oh, we have this goal. How many New Year's resolutions do we have? And then we abandon them, right? And I always use that one as an example. So we go down the well-laid path that we've made and created for ourselves, but a mouse shows up on that path. Well, no matter what the elephant trainer does, the (laughs) elephant's going to do what he wants to do. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's funny. There's, there's another analogy about the elephant and and it's not really an analogy. It's a a proven fact that when the elephant is a baby, um, they tie it to a stake with a, a rope and it can't get away. And they use that same stake and rope once the elephant becomes an adult and still though the elephant is an adult it doesn't believe it can get away and so all they have to do is put that little rope around its foot and that stake and the big elephant stays put yeah because it's been ingrained they have a belief that i can't i can't get away from this so yeah and it's so crazy mickey because you know like i love neuroscience i kind of geek out on it and i'm not a a brain scientist by any way, shape or form, but it intrigues me this whole idea of our mind and, you know, the conscious brain in a real simplistic form can receive messages, but we can also say, no, I don't believe that, or "Eh, that's not for me. And then we can create and innovate. Well, what happens though, is the subconscious brain can't deflect any messages. So even those deflected messages from our conscious brain go into our subconscious, Mm. right? Because we can't stop them from going into our subconscious. It all it does is receive messaging. Mm -hmm. So we receive these messages and they turn into a belief and everyone I know has a time story and they have a money story. Mm. And those are just two that are off the top. Everybody has both of those. 
And what happens is our belief then turns into action. Mm -hmm. And that action then turns into the habits that we create. So if you want to change a habit, you got to unwind what the belief is and what the message was that came into your head and either find out and and prove is it fact or fiction? Because 98% of the time, well, don't quote me, but 90% of the time it's fiction. Mm -hmm. Because anytime we feel chaos, anytime, and I call it being knocked out of heaven, anytime we feel like we're knocked out of like this joyous life that we have, there's some kind of lie going on in our subconscious. Hmm. And you you can have guilt and shame about that. And you teach about this, right? I do. I do. Yeah. Cause I find this is the biggest bind is that people step into a, what I call the voice of judgment and they're judging themselves and then they start beating themselves up. And I talk about transactional analysis, this critical parent, not necessarily your parent, but you in your head saying, Oh, I should do this. Or, you know, you did this terribly or comparing themselves to everybody else. Like all that does is take our energy and suck the energy out of you. Mm -hmm. The vibration, because everything vibrates at a frequency. And so our vibration lowers and then we attract what we vibrate. Right. So sometimes if you get into this thing where you feel like the next shoe is going to drop or like something bad happens when you do something, a lot of times what happens is your vibration has lowered. And so it's like attracting these things, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And the same thing holds true when you raise your vibration. So there's a really good book too called The Gap in the Game. I know you've probably read that. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, Where the gap is really only a clothing store is what my friends and I say. But the gain is looking at where you were, where you want to go, but how far have you come? Mm -hmm. And We live in a world that does the opposite. They say, oh, how much further do you have to go? Right. And that's what creates overwhelm. That's what creates burnout, all of those things versus look at the progress I've made. So a lot of times with clients, I, I have them list out like three wins every Mm -hmm. day because it builds the momentum to keep going, to get to where you want to go. And all that is, is neuroscience. Yeah. Yeah. And you teach this at Gonzaga. Well, I don't teach neuroscience at Gonzaga, but I teach two courses at Gonzaga. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I always forget to bring that up when mm-hmm. I um, introduce myself. But I teach a certificate in servant leadership uh-huh. course. And some people get kind of hung up in the word servant, but it really means that you're a bold leader and you do what's right for people and help serve people in a way that helps them grow and develop, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't mean, you know, just placating people. It's having tough conversations, all that kind of good stuff. So that's a 14 week course. That's not part of a master's or PhD program. Anyone can take that course. Um, And then I teach a foresight and strategy class for the master's level in the school of leadership. And that one really is about, it's in a sick way. I say that because some people think I'm weird when I say this. People come into that class and they think we're going to look at charts and figure out strategy and all of these different things. When really what I'm doing is helping people take a pause and integrate their head, their heart, their intuition, and listen to their body. Mm. Because all of those things can tell us what's coming. Like most of us have had a situation where the hair on the back of your neck's like comes up and you're like, whoa, I need to remove myself from the situation. That's your intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's things that we have a deep knowing about, but we don't slow down enough. I call it slow down to speed up. We don't slow down enough to see what's coming. Hmm. We get into a reactionary mode. Yeah. I see that happen with a lot of entrepreneurs. They're they work too much in their business and not on their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, so the course I teach there is really about that integration and seeing kind of what's getting in the way, because we also have to be in this mode of receiving Hmm. to be able to, to have what's come. So Otto Sharmer out of MIT developed this model and it's called theory U. So it's just the shape of a U where something's dying. And then you have to take time to presence, which is really the law of gestation. And then something's coming. And because nature abhors a vacuum, when we let go of something, we need to be mindful about what comes in its place. Otherwise, what happens is we say yes to things that are not fully a yes, Mm -hmm. which then pulls in the law of sacrifice because we have to let go 
-hmm. of something that's blocking us from receiving the bigger. Right. So that kind of um, leads to my next question. Talk to us about there comes a time when we can't take all of these people with us throughout our entire life. That might be a customer, a client, uh, a vendor, a friend. Um, And we need to break up. And what are your tips on how to gracefully and gently do that? Yeah. And one of the things that I like to look at too, is that words matter and words are matter. So thinking about your word choices really helps. And part of why I look at this is that it's really important, like that we have to do some pre-work before we realize who it is that we need to maybe let go of or what we need to let go of in the realm of, we have to know ourselves. Like one of the biggest characteristics of a servant leader is self-awareness. We have to know who we are. We have to know what our values are. The law of compensation says we're compensated based on what we provide, how we provide it and how difficult it is to let go to go find someone else to do it. So we have to understand those things about ourselves and how we do business. But what happens is we get fear that comes in and says, oh, I'm not making any money right now. So I need to take this client on when we know to the depths of our soul that this is not our avatar. This is not our ideal client. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you done that? I have. Oh yeah, sure. (laughs) Yep. Um, And through learning. So knowing yourself, knowing the values and knowing what you provide. And I, I have, I I say this because I'm hoping to ward off this happening to people. And then I'll talk a little bit more about how to gracefully remove yourself from that. But that way, when someone that you're talking to, and I've had that happen, people come into my office and I'll say to them within this 30 minutes, we're going to get really clear about what you want. And towards the end, we'll talk about what that might look like to work together if it's a good fit. And if it's not working out to be a good fit, I I don't go there Mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. Um, they might get an invite to like, I have an October event coming up to like an entry level um, retreat that I have about mindset and some of the beliefs and universal laws um, to get them into that journey. Um, I've had people before too, that I'm like, you know, I'm not a counselor and I, you probably might need to go see a counselor, right? Because I know what I'm capable of and what I'm willing to do and not willing to do. That's really important. And also remembering in the four agreements, not to take things personally. Mm -hmm. And so that has to happen, but let's say you've gotten yourself in the situation where you have a client or a customer, um, or a vendor that you realize you're not in alignment with anymore. That's the key piece of knowing yourself and knowing your values and understanding who you serve. So if you're not in alignment, then it becomes a really easy conversation. It's like, Mickey, hey, some things have changed in my business. And as I'm looking in alignment, I'm finding that we're just, we're not in alignment anymore. And that's way okay. I'm not, it's not a judgment. It's just, that's where I'm at in my business. And so at this point in time, I'm going to refer you to X, Y, and Z mm-hmm. that might be able to help you better than what I can help you. Mm-hmm. So the whole time I kept the focus on the client and what was best for the client, because deep in my heart, that's really what I want. And I know if it's somebody I need to break up with, it's not somebody that I'm serving well. For me, that's how I found approaching that the best way, because truly that's our usually our intention. Now, if it's somebody that's just annoying, <laughs> and I've had those before, I have to step back and not take it personally and go, what's really going on for this person? Mm-hmm. So I have to really identify, is this person really out of alignment with me? Or is it because my energy is a little bit low and their energy is like in this chaos struggle mm-hmm. part? Um, another thing, you know, sometimes we have friends. I equate this to a hermit crab. I'm sorry, but it's the only analogy I can come up with that works and people understand is that when we level up, no matter what it is, whether it be relationships, whether it be the way we want to live our lives. You know, one of the things is that I've, since I've had COVID, alcohol does not taste real good to me. So I've chosen not to drink. I have, I'll have a cocktail once in a while, but it just doesn't taste good to me anymore. But what's interesting about it is like, so think about that shell of that's a choice I choose to make. And I've outgrown that shell. Mm -hmm. So our, Our most vulnerable point is in between the shells. Sure. And when I get into a bigger shell, sometimes people that aren't as comfortable with me changing the rules, try to pull me back into that shell. 
So for instance, when I'm like, no, I choose not to drink. Are you sure? You sure you don't want something to drink? You know, like it's this constant pressuring. I'm like, stop it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's an example of how that shows up. Mm -hmm. with that sacrifice. And sometimes we do lose relationships, but sacrifice, the word itself has a bad connotation, you know, like people, it's a bad rap. When in fact, I'm just letting go of something that I'm not servicing, or they're not, it's not serving anyone Mm -hmm. at that point. It's outgrown it. Um, I've had friendships that I've outgrown. It doesn't mean I'm still not friends with them. I still do things with them once in a while, but it's not the same type of friendship that it was in the past. Right. And people get scared about that, but the same thing with clients, same thing with business. Sometimes we have these ideas to go forward into something, but it scares us because it's big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that's just messages, right? Like, oh, I'm going to have to work so much harder if I get bigger. Well, not really. (laughs) (laughs) Well, at that, at the core of all that, you can change without growing, but you cannot grow without changing. Yes. And growth and change has trade-offs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like that word better than sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And and your your reference to the crab reminds me of uh, the story of if you go crabbing and you you have a bucket and you get a crab and you put it in the bucket. If you have one crab, you need to have a lid on the bucket. But you get two or more and you don't need a lid anymore because any crab that tries to crawl out, the other crab grabs it and pulls it back down. Oh, interesting, Mickey. I didn't know that. Yeah. And that is like when we're leveling up, um, others, you know, they may be so thrilled for us, you know, congratulations. But then they see that gap between where you were and where you are. And then they're looking at themselves and they see a gap between where they are and where they could be. And that the term crabby, you know, they I they want to pull you back to where they were comfortable with who you were. Yeah. You know, this, this new Debbie is different, it makes yeah. them uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And I would say too, Mickey, to that point, you know, like I have some friendships, my best friend that I mentioned earlier in the podcast that we are just, all, we are just each other's people. Right. And no matter which way we grow, we're both going in the same direction. We may be at different points in different areas, you know, like, she's great at using her voice and relationships and I'm great at other things. And, but we're still going in this direction, but what happens sometimes relationships, one person goes towards the right and then other person goes towards the left. Neither one is right or wrong. It just moves in a different way. And so it does sometimes change that relationship. Um, And that that's true of clients too. That's I'm talking about relationship also with clients Mm -hmm. and we have to step through the fear of thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm going to totally make this up from a numbers perspective. Oh my gosh, I have this one client and it's $500 a month and I I need that $500. Well, that's scarcity. Yes. And what happens, and I mean, this happened when I quit my W2 job, right? When I left that company, all of a sudden, all of these things started coming my way. Hmm. And I mean, within the first 18 months, I was in multiple six figures, And I mean, it was just because I opened up then to receive that. I let go of something that was holding me back. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow. That's powerful stuff. Yeah. I love the universal laws. (laughs) So what events do you have coming up that you, the uh, listening audience might be interested in? Yeah. Thank you for asking Mickey. I actually have two, one that is more immediate. So um, I used to do these twice a year. I'm only going to do them once a year now in Sandpoint. Um, This one is called Cast Your Vision. It's a weekend, starts on a Thursday evening, runs until Saturday um, in the evening or in the late afternoon. And um, it's for women to really take a look at what they want in their life. And then we talk about these limiting beliefs. We talk more about neuroscience, the things that kind of get in the way so that we can stop judging ourselves and pull ourselves out and really look at it from a more objective way. Um, That is October 26th, 27th, and 28th. You can find information about that out on my website at www.leadyourlituplife.com under um, programs, and it'll have retreats there. I think there's a little pop-up box that comes up too. Um, My team is good about doing those types of things. And then I've also started um, a women's mastermind where a mastermind is where you have more than two people. um, And I have a limited number of spaces. The first one is already happening by the time people listen to this, but the second one will start in the spring. 
and I'm looking at a March or April timeframe, we meet virtually. So everything is virtual with the exception of two retreats. And we um, everything is paid for except flights and transportation to and from the um, location. But we do two retreats, one in Mexico and one in Costa Rica. So this group would start the spring in Costa Rica where we get to know each other. We have a photo shoot with a photographer from Chicago and um, really it's about helping your business quantum leap versus taking the small steps. It's about moving in a faster way and having a group of women that support you without judgment. Mm. Um, and that will start in March. Um, so you can look out on my website. There's information out, out on the website about that too. And you can follow me on most of the socials um, as either Debbie Heiser or lead your, lead your life. And I can see in the background, you have one of my favorite books there. Mindset. Oh, mindset. Yeah. 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 On my stack of books back here. That's awesome. This one. Yep. Yeah. And is that a, a book that you would recommend for sure? And absolutely. And any other, um, any other books that you want to shout oh out? My gosh. You really want me to get started on that, Mickey? Oh, just, okay. Pick <laughs> one. Just pick one. Well, I'll give you actually just two. So the mindset, I also, this one working with the law, it's an older book. So the writing is a little bit older, but it goes through all the universal laws. Mm. Um, and then I just recently, I talked about viv vivid vision. I just recently picked up this little book and I don't have it handy on my desk. It's called E squared and it's nine experiments to do with energy. That sounds interesting. It's so interesting. And like the second lesson. So I'll just say this. If you're listening, do this today. And it says, pick a really odd color car oh. and put in the forefront that you're going to see those cars. Mm -hmm. Mine was any vehicle that was like a really odd green. I cannot tell you how many like green, strange vehicles I have seen in Sandpoint, including bicycles in the last few weeks since I've done that. Yep. Um, so try that and see what happens, but it's a good little, I mean, it's little, it's like this little square, it's smaller than my phone. I love that. Yeah. The reticular activating system. Yes. That's, That's just the second exercise, but there's nine exercises to take you through that. So yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So your website again, www.leadyourlituplife.com. Okay. That will be in our comments um, in the recap. Great. Debbie, thank you so much for being with us today and thank joining us on you. this moment with Mickey.